Amid the shifting sands of history, several cities around the world have met an eerie fate. Once thriving and bustling, these urban areas now stand as deserted relics of the past. Join me, we're going to journey through the haunting landscapes of these abandoned ghost cities and explore their stories. Let's start with number 15, Vorkuta. If you travel just north of the Arctic Circle, you'll reach the Russian town of Vorkuta, an epicenter for coal mining during the era of the Soviet Union. At its peak, it had a population of over 250,000 people. Ever since, more than half of the mines have closed. And when combined with the freezing temperatures that can dip as low as negative 58 degrees, it's not hard to see why people are leaving. According to recent population reports, the total population of the city is less than 50,000, and there are now full apartment blocks and city neighborhoods that are frozen in ice and frozen in time. Number 14. Humberstone For decades, Chile's Atacama Desert was filled with saltpeter mines, and Humberstone was one of the settlements that sprung up to support the miners. Founded in 1872, the saltpeter extracted here was used to create fertilizers. However, by the late 1920s, German scientists discovered that synthesized ammonia could be used to make fertilizer more efficiently and at a fraction of the cost. While the Peru Nitrate Company modernized Humberston in an attempt to produce a competitive natural saltpeter, Humberston was ultimately closed in 1960, and in 2005, the dusty, abandoned town became a UNESCO World Heritage Site. Number 13. Kennecott In 1900, copper was discovered in Kennecott, leading to the creation of a mine by the Kennecott Copper Corporation. Soon, the mine was in full operation, making the company more than $100 million. However, by 1938, the copper deposits were mostly gone, leading to the mine being abandoned and railroad services being discontinued. While a few dozen people still live in the area, Kennecott is now virtually abandoned. Now, despite this, in an interesting move, it's been incorporated into the Wrangell Street Elias National Park and Preserve, and it now serves as a time capsule of Alaska's historic mining era. Number 12. Orador Serglan On June 10th of 1944, SS officer Helmut Kumpf was found dead near the French town of Orador Serglan. In what can only be described as a disgusting show of brutality, SS officer Adolf Diekemann decided to respond by massacring the town. In one fell swoop, he ordered that all the women and children be locked into a burning barn and shot. Similarly, all of the men were laid into barns where their legs were shot before being doused in gasoline and lit aflame. In some, a total of 643 people were murdered, with just six managing to escape the massacre alive. Ever since, the partially burnt downtown has been left untouched as a monument to those victims, and it can still be visited today. Number 11. Bodie When you think of an old spaghetti western, a town like Bodie is probably what comes to mind. It's located in eastern California, the town was settled in 1859 after a small gold deposit was found in the area. The discovery of larger deposits in 1876 led to an even bigger rush, and by 1879 it had between 7 to 10,000 people and a total of 2,000 buildings. It quickly gained a bad reputation for being a so-called sea of sin, complete with shootouts, gambling rings, and of course brothels. However, by 1910 the gold had all but dried up, and in 1942 the last mine was closed. Since then, it's become a national historic landmark and provides a stunning but eerie testament to what life was like in the Wild West. Number 10. Kayakyo Originally built in the 1700s, Kayakyo was a Turkish town that was mostly inhabited by Turkey's Greek community. It's located in the southwest of the country, it was built in a classic Greek style, and by the early 1900s, as many as 20,000 Greek Orthodox residents peacefully lived in the town alongside their Turkish neighbors. However, politics would lead to the destruction of this harmonious existence. The messy fallout of World War I and the collapse of the Ottoman Empire led to the land grabs of the Greco-Turkish War, and after the Greeks lost, Turkey's Greek Orthodox community was often targeted in attacks. Hundreds of thousands of Turkish Greeks fled the violence, and while many in Kayoko stayed, they eventually left in 1923, after a mutual and compulsory population exchange was set up between the Greek and Turkish governments. The end result is a town where approximately 350 homes now sit empty and mostly roofless alongside two Greek Orthodox churches and the fountains and cisterns that watered the city. Unfortunately, time has not been kind to the area, as harsh winters and strong winds have stripped the buildings down to ruins, making the town look ancient. 
And while a private museum tells the story of the town, it's now a far quieter place than it was just a hundred years ago. Number 9. Plymouth While Pompeii may be the world's most famous ash-filled city of the ancient world, Montserrat's capital of Plymouth is its modern equivalent. Located in the southeastern Caribbean, Montserrat is an overseas territory of the United Kingdom. First settled by Europeans in 1632, Plymouth acted as the capital of the island until July of 1995. That's because after centuries of inactivity, the Soufriere Hills volcano began to blow, and the resulting devastation would rock the island to its core. In a series of large eruptions, pyroclastic flows of lava and ash spewed across the southern portion of the island, and by December of that year, the entire town was completely evacuated by the British Navy. While residents were allowed to return in 1997, by June of that year, the volcano had begun to erupt once more. This proved to be the right call. Between August 4th and 8th, 80% of Plymouth was destroyed and buried in 1.4 meters of ash. Since Plymouth had been the source of most of the economic activity, the island was mostly abandoned, with most residents opting to move to the mainland United Kingdom. To this day, the southern area of the island is still deemed to be an exclusion zone. However, if you'd like to visit the mostly buried city of Plymouth, you can take an organized tour from Antigua for about 150 bucks. However, since the volcano is still active, you'd definitely be entering at your own risk. Number 8. Colmanskop Mining towns, they tend to have pretty short lifespans, and the settlement of Kolmanskop in Namibia is certainly no exception. The story goes that in 1908, a Namibian railway worker was shoveling a railroad tracks clear of sand when he saw some shining stones. These were identified by his German employer as being diamonds, and it wasn't long until a diamond rush ensued. By 1912, the town of Kolmanskop had sprung up to accommodate the miners, and in its day, the town became quite lucrative producing 11.7% of the world's diamond supply. It was so chock full of diamonds that many of the German prospectors had to do little more than just pick the diamonds up off the desert floor. This made many of them overnight millionaires and allowed for the creation of modern amenities such as hospitals, a ballroom, ice factory, theater, sports hall, and a casino, alongside notable achievements such as the purchase of the first African X-ray and the tram. However, the good times couldn't last forever. By 1928, the richest diamond mines on the planet were discovered 260 kilometers south, causing many of the townspeople to leave that area. Those who remained continued to toil away, but by 1956, the town was pretty much completely abandoned. Ever since, the natural forces of the desert have more or less reclaimed the site, covering Kolmanskop in knee-deep high sand. If you're interested in giving it a look, the town can be visited on select days of the week between 8 a.m. and 1 p.m., making it an interesting stop on a trip through Southwest Africa. Moving on to number 7, Walhalla. All right, now, generally speaking, when a ghost city becomes a ghost city, it remains abandoned forever. However, Walhalla is a rare case of a ghost town that managed to come back from obscurity. Located in southeastern Australia, it was founded in late 1862 as a gold mining community. While it began its life as a prime spot for gold panning, all of the surface gold was exhausted in about a year, and soon bona fide underground mining began. From 1863 until 1900, Walhalla was producing large quantities of gold, and this led to it having tons of shops, a daily passenger train, and for a brief time in 1884, leading the world in having two electric streetlights. At its peak, its population reached a respectable 2,000 people, and sporting associations such as football and cricket clubs began to take root. All in all, Walhalla had become a proper town. However, the good times would not last forever. As the story with many mining towns, the gold began to dry out, and in 1914, the last major mine closed. Soon, one of the railway's main uses became the removal of old buildings out of town, and by the early 1970s, the town was all but abandoned. Yet, unlike most of the towns on this list, the story didn't end here. In the late 1970s, Walhalla began to grow once more. Somewhat out of the blue, efforts were made to turn Walhalla into a holiday destination by refurbishing some of the old buildings and creating tourist facilities. This has led to the town taking on an undeniable charm. And thanks to its relaxed atmosphere and stunning valley location, it's a great place to go vacation. As such, if you happen to be in Australia, it could make for a great day trip. Walhalla. Number 6. Krakow As far as abandoned towns go, few are quite as picturesque as Krakow. 
Located in the southern Italian province of Basilicata, old tombs in the area suggest that it was founded all the way back in the 8th century BC. It stands apart thanks to it being perched atop a 400-meter tall cliff, and throughout the ages, this height protected it from the Italian peninsula's frequent wars. Over time, this security and protection allowed it to grow, and by 1561 it reached its peak population of 2,590 people. At this point, it had guard towers, palaces, and even its own university, making it an important local hub. However, from this point onwards, a slow and steady decline took place. People began to leave the town, and events such as the wars of Italian unification and mass migrations to the New World didn't help matters. Yet the town continued on, and it would likely have continued to somewhat of a sizable population had it not been for human error. You see, poorly installed sewer and water systems began to make the soil that Krakow was built on top of extremely damp and unstable. This led to a series of mudslides, and in 1963, things got so bad that the majority of Krakow's residents were forced to move to the nearby town of Krakow Peshera. While this was the end of Krakow being an inhabited city, it soon became famous. Thanks to its beautiful old buildings and eerie yet compelling vibe, it was chosen as a filming site for famous films such as The Passion of the Christ and Christ Stopped at Eboli. The town has also continued to have religious significance, as six times a year locals return to celebrate religious festivals dedicated to the Virgin Mary. However, beyond these purposes, Krakow is uninhabited and it can only be visited on guided tours. And while it is necessary to wear a hard hat in order to fend off any falling debris, most would agree that a visit here is a pretty cool experience. Number 5. Hashima Island Japan is one of the world's foremost manufacturing superpowers, and for a long time, Hashima Island helped supply their industrial production. In 1867, a coal mining colony was established on the island, and in response, workers and their families began to flock there. This colony was soon bought out by Mitsubishi, and it didn't take long for it to become an extremely profitable venture. This profitability was increased by the mid-1930s, as these conflicts with Korea and China brought in prisoners of war who were used as slave laborers in the mines. This state of affairs continued until Japan's loss in World War II. However, while the slave laborers may have returned home, the end of the war didn't signal an end to the profits. Thanks to the post-war boom, Hashima Island continued to grow, and at its height in the 1950s, it housed 5,200 residents in a space of just 0.06 square kilometers, making it one of the most densely packed places on Earth. Yet in 1974, Mitsubishi closed down their mine, leading to the mine being abandoned almost immediately. As a result, Hashima Island is a place that is eerily stuck in the past, as while empty, it still contains its old concrete apartments, schools, barber shops, and swimming pools. Yet, despite this abandonment, Hashima Island has been able to stir up more than its fair share of controversy. The first came in 2009, when Japan nominated the island to be a UNESCO World Heritage Site due to it being an important factor in spurring the Meiji Industrial Revolution. However, South and North Korea both opposed this addition, as they felt that the island's legacy as a prisoner of war camp made it unworthy of a UNESCO title. Yet, to both their benefits, South Korea and Japan did eventually reach a compromise, where Japan agreed to acknowledge the island's dark past to tourists in exchange for South Korea withdrawing its opposition. As a result, in 2015, it was officially named as a UNESCO World Heritage Site. If you'd like to visit Hashima Island, it can now be seen for a price that's equivalent to about 35 to 50 bucks, making it a great spot to visit if you're interested in a bit of dark history that's off the beaten path. Number 4. Kitso of all the abandoned places on this list, Kitso's story may just be one of the strangest. That's because Kitso traces its origins not to the distant past, but to a mining operation in the late 1970s. Its story begins in the mountains of northern British Columbia, which is on the west coast of Canada. It was here where, of all things, there was a massive molybdenum mine. While potentially profitable on the surface, there was just one issue. It was in the veritable middle of nowhere. Prince Rupert, which was the nearest major community, was a whopping four hours away, and this was a problem, because the mine needed to attract skilled tradesmen, accountants, and engineers. The mining company's solution was to make a town that was so incredible that people would want to stay. Christened as Kitso, the town was constructed in 1979 until 1981, built at the modern-day cost of about $145 million. It all had modern conveniences, too, of the 1980s suburban society. As such, they built a medical clinic, schools, apartment buildings, houses, a rec center, a curling rink, swimming pool, and of course, a shopping mall. 
Then they installed the mining engineer as mayor and had everyone move in immediately. Strangely enough, there were no police, but despite this, there was no problems with drinking or violence, and according to reports from the townspeople, there was simply no conflict. After all, they shared a common goal of living in a community and making this strange project work, and to that end, they did all they could to make Casso an incredible place to live. However, despite their best efforts, all of it would come crashing down in just a few short years. While Kitsou may have been a great town, what wasn't so great was the worldwide molybdenum market. Even during construction, prices of it were starting to fall, and with the larger U.S. mines under tremendous stress and the cash flow of the company at risk, the decision was made to pull the plug on Kitsou. As such, in late 1982, the mine was closed, and in early 1983, the town was officially abandoned. Beyond just being a successful social experiment, Kitso has retained quite the legacy. After all, it was the last in a long line of British Columbian towns that was founded because of a natural resource, and it was also the last to be abandoned for the same reason. Ever since, mining companies have simply opted against operating company towns. Instead, if they want to mine, drill, or do fracking in a remote part of British Columbia, they'll build a work camp and fly in employees on short-term contracts. As such, Kitsou has a special place in the hearts of many people. Number 3. Pripyat Alright, now generally speaking, cities become abandoned thanks to things such as natural disasters or changing economic realities. However, Pripyat's decline was a little different than most. That's because in April of 1986, the Ukrainian town was abandoned after a nuclear reactor melted down at the nearby Chernobyl nuclear power plant. The story goes that the reactor in question was having its power reduced in preparation for an electrical test. However, things didn't go to plan, when unexpectedly the reactor's power dropped to near zero. At this point, the workers immediately tried to bring the reactor back to normal levels, but were only able to partially restore the power. While this should have led to an end in electrical testing, the power plant workers didn't know the risks, and so went ahead with the test. Unfortunately, this change in power had made the reactor unstable, and so when operators tried to initiate a reactor shutdown, a combination of the instability and the reactor's design flaws caused a massive nuclear chain reaction. This reaction created two large explosions and a fire that not only severely damaged the reactor and the power plant, but also released massive amounts of radiation into the air. This prompted an evacuation of the nearby town of Pripyat, and soon, a 30-kilometer exclusion zone was set up around the blast. Ever since, nuclear radiation levels have remained dangerously high, and while some seniors have refused to leave Pripyat, which used to be the home of about 50,000 people, it's remained mostly abandoned. As a result, wildlife has begun to reclaim the city. While the nuclear radiation has reared its ugly head, after all, some animals have had genetic mutations and some of the plants have been seen glowing, the wildlife levels are still far higher than they were when Pripyat was a populated town, and to this date, the animal populations are comparable to that of a national park. One day, it is believed that this reclamation will more or less lead to Pripyat being swallowed up by the surrounding forest. Now, if you're a tourist who would like to visit, you're currently out of luck. You see, in the past, you could pay a tour guide between $100 and $130 for a full-day experience, with it even being possible to go into the control room 4 of the power plant, which is where the accident actually happened. However, when Russia invaded Ukraine in February of 2022, things got a bit dicey. That's because on the very first day of the invasion, Russian troops poured into Pripyat. And while they have since left, the fact that Pripyat lies so close to the borders of the conflict and to the neighboring Belarus, it's made the ghost city off-limits for the time being. Number 2. Burj al -Baba. While most of the cities on this list were filled with people before being abandoned, Burj al -Baba was instead abandoned by its developers. Located in the northwestern Turkey, about halfway between Istanbul and Ankara, it's set beside the historical town of Mudumu. Famous for its 600-year-old mosque and traditional Ottoman houses, it's been a popular local tourist site for years, and it was this popularity that caught the eye of the Sarat Group. The Sarat Group is a property developer from Dubai, and they had the idea of constructing a massive vacation destination in the area. Set to have over 700 castles, a shopping center, an entertainment center, and Turkish baths from natural hot springs, the plan was for it to be a massive endeavor that would cater to the rich Arab clientele. Despite local opposition, the project broke ground in 2014, and in the first few years of its existence, things went well. 
After shelling out about 200 million bucks, 580 castles were built, and each was set to cost between anywhere from 370 to 500 thousand dollars. Each of these estates were also top of the line, as each villa not only had underfloor heating and jacuzzis on every level, but were also emblematic of European luxury. However, there was trouble in paradise. First and foremost, locals became increasingly angry as the castles didn't resemble the local architecture and were a bit of an eyesore. A lawsuit was also filed against the developers, and this lawsuit claimed the company destroyed trees and harmed the environment, and this only further angered residents. While this was all bad enough, the final tipping point came when in the midst of construction, the Sarat Group declared bankruptcy. This led to a sudden halt in construction, and the project was promptly abandoned in 2019. What is left is a really strange site, now completely abandoned. The end result is a bunch of extremely garish, out-of-place mini-castles in the Turkish countryside, and by all accounts, they give an eerie, unsettling feeling. This has made the area a tourist site of sorts for entirely different reasons, as many come to just gawk at its absurdity. However, all hope has not been lost. In 2020, Sarat came out of bankruptcy and sold the project to a multinational American corporation known as Nova Group Holdings. According to the CEO of Nova Turkey, quote, Yes, we've acquired this project and a few more from Sarat. We will continue as planned, and like Sarat, we are actively looking towards the Gulf countries for future clients." End quote. However, what exactly that means for Burj El Bala is still unknown. Some believe that Nova may add nothing and simply monetize what is now an odd tourist attraction. Others believe that Nova may alter the project to make it less kitschy. And others believe that Nova might just push ahead with construction as per the Sarat's group original plans. However, the reality is, is that nothing is set in stone, and on my end, I'm excited to see what the future holds for this place. Number 1. Fordlandia Henry Ford was one of the most successful capitalists in American history, and in his efforts to acquire wealth, he committed what in modern money would amount to a $345 million misstep. During the 1920s, the Ford Motor Company was booming, making millions of cars for consumers around the world. However, while production was running well, there was just one hitch. British firms in Southeast Asia had a monopoly over the rubber being used for its tires. This was in turn driving up the price, and so in order to subvert it, he attempted to make his own rubber in the depths of the Amazon. His idea was to create an idealistic American working-class town where workers would attend poetry readings, square dances, and sing-alongs, and most importantly, produce thousands of tons of rubber. In order to get things moving, he bought a plot of land along the Tapajos River in 1926, and by 1928, he had created the city of Fortlandia. Filled with American-style bungalows, it had a number of amenities, such as swimming pools, hotels, a library, a power plant, and even a golf course. And the hope was that it would be somewhere where both homegrown Brazilian workers and expats from Ford's American factories could work together in harmony. However, the entire experiment immediately became a disaster. The first major issue was that there were no roads connecting Fordlandia to the rest of Brazil. Therefore, the only way to enter the town was by the river, which proved to be a logistical nightmare. To make matters worse, the American planters, who had little knowledge of tropical rubber cultivation, made the mistake of planting all the rubber trees close together rather than space them apart. This caused most of them to barely grow, and even those that did quickly succumbed to tree fungus, disease, and various crop-eating critters. Worst of all, the Americans managed to infuriate their Brazilian workers by imposing strict sets of Ford-inspired rules that included bans on alcohol, tobacco, and of all things, soccer. In tandem, all of these factors created massive tensions, and in 1930, things reached a breaking point over Ford's imposed diet. The Brazilian-born workers revolted, and in doing so, proceeded to break windows, overturn cars, cut the telegraph wires, and chase away the managers and town cook into the jungle. While the Brazilian army came in and settled things a few days later, it became clear that things weren't working, and in 1933, the decision was made to create a new town 40 kilometers downriver. Known as Belterra, it did slightly better than Fordlandia, however, given that it produced just 750 tons of rubber, it was a far cry from the 38,000 tons that Ford had envisioned. In any case, by the 1940s, synthetic rubber became easy to mass-produce, making natural rubber obsolete. In response, Henry Ford's son, who was now in control of the company, decided to bow out of the rubber industry altogether. 
In 1945, he sold the land back to the Brazilian government for pennies on the dollar, and as a result, both Ford Landia and Belterra sit abandoned. However, many of the structures still remain, and they can be visited to this very day. I'll see you guys next time. Thank you to our channel members.